Okay. So the other game we played, I don't think you should buy it. No, I don't know if you can buy it. Square on sale. It's an so old this is game. Actually, it's actually from 2005, but it's considered first look because it was not easy to obtain in the U.S. as like a Japanese published game, and we they somehow got a copy of it. Uh, Designed by uh, Sawada Taiju. Right. Um, so basically what this game is, is it's Othello. You've played Othello, also known as Iago or Reversi. Reversi. It's weird how many people only know it as Reversi. I ran into a coworker like last month who literally had no idea what Othello was. I knew it as Othello because that's what the board game in the store was called, yep. right? But then on uh, like on the computer, I was like Reversi, what's that? And I'm like, oh, it's Othello. Yep, same same and experience. Then, and then on Linux in KDE Linux, uh, well KDE on Linux, there was a there was like K Iago or something. And I was like, what is Iago? I'm like, oh, it's reverse <laughs> slash hotel. How many different names are there for this stupid game? It's like Klondike, Solitaire, right? It's all these same names for the different names of the yep. same game. Now I've never seen a game incorporate Othello so nakedly before, except like actually, you know what did of all things? WarioWare on the GameCube. Yes. But yeah, it, did. it did. But the what the point I want to make, and just remember what I'm about to say, and we'll get to it in later in this review. There is a fundamental problem with Othello in that the heuristics or the math, like the hard math to actually be good at Othello, are not really human implementable. Like humans cannot do that. It is very hard to learn the the right way to be good at Othello at any scale. But it is trivial. On a small board, you could do it. It Even, yeah, like a four-tile board, sure. Yeah. Six-tile, eight-tile, like the tiniest. As soon as you get above like three-by-three, three, humans cannot be good at Othello. Right, well, Othello is typically played on like, what, five-by-five, seven-by-seven, something like that. But, yeah, but... A lot of the, I don't know what the, I guess the actual board game is a huge board, right? But the most of the apps I played where it would let you choose the board size. Yep. I remember five by five and seven by seven usually being defaults. But there is a easy algorithm for computers that can play Othello perfectly. Uh, if you play any like random Othello online, there's a decent chance it implements that algorithm. You will never win. There's literally no Can't way Can't you win. just use that algorithm in your human head? It's too difficult for a human to do in their head. I don't think anyone's ever played Othello. Maybe perfectly. I'll spend the, this uh, this my free time. <laughs> I tried. To... I I actually have some really fucking complex Othello heuristics. My heuristic for Othello is get in the corner. No one can take you once you're in the corner. My heuristic is based on a point value that I've assigned to every type of square on the board, and then that point, ah. and then those points are mitigated or altered by board states, but. I can't say like I can't say the rule for doing that. I've just memorized certain patterns, and if I see those patterns in the local area, I know how to interact with that area. Anyway, so Square on Sale is Othello. However, there is two big changes to this game, right? Uh, change number one is that normally in Othello, let's say I place in the top left corner and then the bottom right corner, all the pieces on that diagonal would get filled in with my dudes if they're right? there, like if they're filled if, in already. You'll, obviously, they'll be flipped. But you, you're not allowed to play in a regular Othello. You're not allowed to play non-adjacent. Yep, you gotta to, you gotta place it so there would convert it. So thing. that wouldn't be a legal play in regular Othello unless they were all filled in anyway. Yep. Where Square on Sale, it is a legal play for reasons we'll get into. But anyway, what happens in Square on Sale is the same thing. I play one and I play another. I play a second piece, and all the in between places are now mine. But instead of just conquering them. I place my pieces on top of the enemy pieces that I've conquered uh, such that they're each place on the board, each square is stacking higher and higher, right? And how high the stack is, is how many points that spot is worth. And whoever has the top piece in the stack is the owner of those points. So, so if the... Yeah, a square that changed hands more times is just worth more points to whoever has it when the game ends. And the game doesn't end when the thing's full like Othello. It ends based on a whole bunch of rules. Right. The second major thing in the game is that it is a bidding game. You don't just, on your turn, go on a spot that you want to go on. You bid on a spot you want to go on with money, right? And you can and just bid you'll... on a random spot. I could be like, I'll bid on the corner. I'll just go on the corner right now. Yep. Uh, and when you bid, you have to basically just outbid the current bid on that spot if there is one. There might not be one, in which case you could bid like a dollar, right? You put your money on the spot so that, and the next person who has to come around knows how high the bar is for bidding. And then you don't get that spot 
for three turns. You bid, you put the two on there. It flips down to a one, right, the next turn. And then the turn after that, you actually would conquer the spot. And if someone outbids you, right, they would take the countdown timer at its current state of two or one, right? And would have, so now if people keep outbidding on a spot, it never ticks down because it just keeps staying yep. at its current position. This is a little, so, it seems a little complex and it is a little bit difficult to teach this, but once you start playing, it makes sense. Basically, you have a limited number of dollars and you can bid and overbid and you'll just leave a pile of dollars on the space. And when you right, see you it, basically, what it means is you bid on a space and you win the space if no one outbids you for twice around the board. Yep. But once you win a space, yeah, you put your uh, square on top, but now your money stays there. And if it's uh, any space other than the edges, every round, instead of doing your bid, you can spend an action to take a dollar from all the stacks you've left out there. So you might right, run so out of normally money. On your, right, so on your turn, if you have any money in the middle nine spaces, you would pick up one dollar from each of the nine spaces right? that's left hanging out there yep. to get your money back slowly because you have a limited money supply. You just start with all your money, right? It's not like you're making money. It's like you start with all your money, you put it out to bid, and after, if you get outbid, you get all the money back. But if you successfully bid, then the money you bid slowly comes back to you, right? From, I guess, your people paying rent who live in the building you own, I guess, <laughs> is the metaphor, right? But if you put money on the outside spaces, the, not the nine central spaces, the outside uh, five, 10, 16 spaces, right? Uh that money, because the outside spaces are stronger because it's Othello, right? Yep. Those are harder but to take away. They're not they're more powerful. They're not as powerful as an Othello because someone doesn't have to maneuver heuristically to take them. They can take them just by bidding on top of you at yes, any time. Those out, the money that you put in those outside spaces, you don't just get back slowly from rents. You have to forego bidding for a turn and then you can take $1 from every stack you have on an outside space. So if you go for a lot of outside spaces to try to make lots of strong Othello plays and put out lots of your building square tiles, then you will end up with your money stuck in the outside edges of the board. You'll have to spend your turns getting that money back when other people will come in and actually reconquer all the spaces yep. <laughs> while you're not bidding. And now what did you actually get? Right. And then I think the game ends, there's a bunch of conditions, but one of the conditions is I think, what if every square, square has something in it? Yeah, I think if every square has something in it, the game ends. If, if one someone player puts runs out, out all their, yeah, if you put out all your squares, the game ends. Yep. Uh, I forget. There but, might be another end condition, but right. there's this, another, no, this there's one other mechanic the, oh yeah, involved. The other mechanic? There's one other mechanic involving some jemmies on the board to incentivize you to right. go to certain spaces. There's little jemmies on the board at the in the early game, so that let you like you know con get some extra points here and there to, to sort of so if you go early and get conquered late, you still got some points for going early. Um, but that's not really a big deal. It's more of a balancer. Right? Yep. Uh, though they are substantial amounts of points, it's hard to get oh, points yeah. in this game. Yeah, they're not insignificant, but they're they're just sort of like there. But right? that end game condition that sort of leads to my point. Remember that heuristic thing. So Othello has non human like implementable heuristics. Like Othello, it, humans basically can't be good at Othello. But this game plays in the same heuristic space, but because of all these differences from Othello, no Othello heuristics actually work. So it's as complex as Othello in terms of humans probably can't build reasonable heuristics, but simultaneously, people who are good at Othello will not actually necessarily be good at this game. Because for example, in Othello, if you get a corner space, there is literally no way to lose that. No. Like none. It's invincible. In this game, like corner spaces just get eaten. Uh, in Othello, you can assign very clear point values to like how worthwhile the space is, because once the space is in, it's locked in. It can only be taken from you by being attacked within the placement rules of the game. Here, there are multiple avenues for attack, and Othello ends when, uh, when the game is sort of full and complete, kind of like a go ending. But this game ends on other conditions, so you can't rely on the board filling. The game might end well before it fills, and you're just hosed. So... You can't even rely on any knowledge of Othello to be good at this game. Right. Like, I had a pretty good play on the board, uh, but then the game ended before my the, my the ticker ran out on my bid, 
And the result of that was uh, I didn't make the big play, and my yep. score suffered a lot because of the timing of the game ending, not even because worse, I made a bad play. I was doing really well in the beginning, but then I lost a bunch of places. But that was fine because based on my Othello heuristics, because I played a hell of a lot of Othello, I knew that I would be able to retake those places pretty easily, and I had a plan. And then again, the game ended early, which is not something that Othello heuristics take into account, and I just got boned. I went from being in first place by a lot to being in second to last place. Yep. So even though it's a pretty simple game, it's just got, what, three or four components, right? A board, squares, little money tokens, and some jemmies, right? It's All it is is bidding on spaces and then Othelloing when you win the space. Right, and then adding up score. There's not a lot going on, but there is way too much. That particular combination of simple ingredients ends up being way too complex for human brains. Yep, I don't think if I played this 10 more times, I would be recognizably better at it. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think I could get better at it without study. And like for Othello, you know how I got better at Othello as a kid? Study, like reading books on it and like playing out scenarios and memorizing patterns. That is what it would take to be very good at this game. And I right. don't know if normal people are willing, able to do that or if it's even worthwhile to do it. I don't know if the ceiling on the game is as high as Go, but it's very, very high. And the floor is definitely lower than Go's floor. I think this yeah. is a much more this is a much more accessible game than Go. Like in Go, you just basically just get destroyed until you get good enough and recognize enough patterns. You can actually kind of play this if you just have some brains. Yep. Right. But you can't play it really well, <laughs> right? Without a lot like super genius level. It's almost um, like while I was playing it, like I like to talk a lot about brain feel in games. Like what does this game feel like? This game didn't feel like anything. I was I was like reverting back to these like raw naked heuristics and like I could not model the game in my brain. I was following when we first started like 3 or 4 rounds in, I was modeling it based on Othello and then because of the bidding and everything, Suddenly, my mental model deviated rapidly from what the game was actually doing, so I had to throw it all away and just play completely raw. And yeah, the only the only way I was able to get, keep the game in my brain is what I was doing was basically like it became. I would try to look and figure out what to do, and it became so messy that I just went like blank. And yeah. what I ended up what I ended up doing was just focusing on a small part of the game only and ignoring the rest. Yep, being like, okay, here's my guys. Here's the play. Here's a play that I see that I can make that could work. Uh, I'll recognize this one aspect of the game and focus on that and ignore everything else. And that didn't work out great, but it got me to help me make a decision at least so about what to do. I want to play it again, but I don't think that will change anything I have to say about the game. And I really can't recommend anyone buy it. Oh, I mean, first of all, I don't recommend you buy it because this is such an easy game to make. True. You can. <laughs> you don't really this. need to buy it. You could find, like, your grandpa's Othello. You know, the one with the green board and um, the little plastic things, like the little yeah, plastic also, shields. Also, I don't know if the game even has a publisher in the United States uh, or in English. Uh, we were playing like a, you know, sort of a messy looking, I don't even know who published the copy we were playing with. Yep. It wasn't the original Japanese publish. Uh, maybe it was the European one, but we had rules printed from the internet clearly and not a real rule book. Um, so yeah, I, I don't even know if you can uh, purchase it. If you can, you know, there, this is for- <laughs> There are two threads in the Board Game Geek forum for this. The first one was started 15 years ago and it just says more information. The second mm-hmm. thread is how to get a copy from eight months ago. Yep. There are a total of nine posts about this game on all of Board Game Geek. Right. So if this is if this game is up your alley, I recommend you know making a copy and playing it that way. And if you get really into it, then find a way to get a legit copy somehow. I could see a publisher like say Big Cat Games or someone publishing uh. this in English at some point. Um, but I don't think that's happening right now, so do what you can. But yeah, this is not for everyone. Uh, but if you are someone who cares about games, likes really hard games, likes abstract games and bidding games... If you want uh, that blank feeling that Scott described, the like 
I am in a world with no heuristics, like a world with no rules. What do I do? Yeah. Like if you want uh, a game where you can't apply most of the things you know about games to it to get better at it quickly, this is the game for you. Right. It's like, you know about bidding that doesn't help you. You know about Othello that doesn't help you, yep. even though it's a bidding Othello, primarily. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, almost, you know, you know what it's like? You know, in, uh, oh God, and music started playing. Okay, there we go. <laughs> There's no weird pipeline with the remote thing. I think that got right. recorded on your channel. But anyway, <laughs> uh, this, you know, where was I going? I lost my entire train of thought now. I went blank. Right. right. Well, you know, when you, there's a language, like German, language you don't speak. And there's cognates, like some languages use the same or a similar sounding word to mean something like T, Ch, Chai, like you can kind of figure stuff out. It sounds very similar. But then there's false cognates, a word that sounds a lot like a word you know, but it actually means something completely different. Like mm -hmm. uh, in French, uh, I was writing a thing. I remember I said like, uh, mon aunt est formidable. Like my aunt is formidable. That does not really mean formidable. <laughs> That's not what that means in English effectively, but formidable and what formidable actually means in French, like they're not really the same thing. So you can be led astray by it appearing to be similar to something you know. Right. In Th Spanish, someone might say cerveza and you might think, oh, does that have to do with service? Right. It's like, no, that means beer. Yep. Right. It's like. <laughs> so. Uh, this game has the f is false heuristics. Yes. If you try to be good at the if you if you're good at bidding and good at Othello, I think you will do worse at this game than someone who has never played a bidding game and has never played Othello. All right. So yeah, that's uh, that's enough of that. I think that was the show. <laughs> <laughs>